Good evening. Hello, good evening. Um, depending on where you are joining us from, I guess it's good evening or good afternoon, or, and welcome to the digital, this digital talk as part of the RIBA and Vitra talks. Also, it's uh, part of the London Design Festival. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and this talk is with uh, Auden Opdal and Susan Carruth of the Architecture Practice 3XN with their partner and research organization, GXN. We're thrilled to be streaming Auden and Susan direct from Copenhagen from this talk, whilst the rest of us are based across the world, some at home, some perhaps even in the office. As I briefly mentioned, this is part of the London Design Festival 2020, but it also coincides with People, Place and Planet, a wider series of online RIBA events throughout September with a focus on sustainability. Tonight's talk continues our ongoing RIBA and Vitra talk series, which continues to showcase the best in contemporary established and emerging voices in architecture. Over the past two years, leading architects have been speaking in this series at events taking place in London, across the UK, and also internationally, with a number of events in Istanbul. Thank you therefore to Vitra Bathrooms who are partnering with the RIBA by sponsoring this prestigious event. Now, I first came across 3XN, GXN when I visited uh, Copenhagen, must have been about seven years ago, I guess, um, to give a, a, an RIBA award, we eventually decided to give it an award, to the uh, Blue Planet Aquarium there. And I was really pr uh, privileged both to see that building, but, but even more interested in some ways to see the, the office of 3XN, GXN, and to visit the upstairs area there, because at that time they were in a slightly different office, and the attic space, I seem to remember, was a kind of hive of activity of research that was supporting and in a way sponsoring the architecture below. It was a very exciting dynamic between architecture and research. So the practice, uh, as you probably know, is uh, known globally, founded in 1986, three decades of very human focused architecture amongst the most high profile projects of the IOC headquarters in Lausanne, New Fish Market in Australia, which we'll see something of, and the Blue Planet Aquarium in, in Copenhagen. Uh, and now with offices also in the UK and London, uh, we'll see their work emerging in Broadgate. Uh, the work, the research work is based around behavioral design, around the circular economy, sustainability, and around dig digital design. And tonight's talk will last just over an hour with a lecture by Auden and Susan, following by a chaired conversation. We've collected some questions in advance, um, but if you have any more, do contact us and we'll try and feed them into the, into the process. Contact talks at riba.org and we'll collate them for inclusion later. So I'm going to hand over to Susan and Auden soon, but before that, I've just got a couple of housekeeping points. Firstly, we are live streaming tonight's event, which means we, uh, we, we can't see or hear the audience. If you experience any issues or have any queries, please email talks at rmba.org and someone will get back to you. If you are a social media user, feel free to use the hashtag rmbavitra. That's all from me, and I'm very happy to hand over to Auden and Susan. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, we are honored uh, to be invited to, to part participate in, in these talks. And um, today, um, obviously, as Peter said, we will talk about uh, 3XN and GXN, but more importantly, how we combined uh, research and uh, practice. Um, our office um, is located here in Copenhagen. This is where I'm sitting at the moment and uh, <laughs> doing this talk, essentially. And we are all kind of located in one big space, uh, but we also have other offices, uh, an office in New York, Sydney, Stockholm, and now also London. I think, you know, we've been through a pandemic now, but obviously we've already started earlier uh, working uh, overseas, uh, 
uh, via video and all of that because our different locations. Um, um, and, um, and, and therefore also in our offices, there's, there's quite a few nationalities, people from different cultures. Uh, GXN, for example, also have uh, over 100 funded uh, research projects. And I think that is uh, something that is quite unique with our practice. Um, it informs all our work um, and, and works as a design driver in, in our, uh, in our uh, approach to architecture. We, we essentially, and I think maybe I've already said it, but we essentially do uh, work all over the world. Um, we also, our work spans from um, obviously like master plans to all, all kinds of different typologies within architecture, but also down to products, um, publications. Uh, we do a lot of behavior studies, circularity, but also branding uh, interior designs. So it's, it's, it's a rather a broad spectrum of things we're working on. Um, and I would like to kind of start uh, this talk to, to, um, to talk a little bit about how we, we essentially uh, develop uh, our, our, uh, uh, our architecture uh, and ideas. And one thing that is for certain, it's not like this. We, we are not kind of standing and waiting for ideas to fall uh, from the tree or something like that. Uh, we believe that actually uh, working within the field of architecture takes a lot of investigations, a lot of hard work. And therefore, that was some of the intentions as well when, when GXN was uh, uh, founded and, and, uh, and having kind of that research uh, entity within the, within the office itself. Uh, it's, it's part of that kind of methodology. Um, in our work, we obviously use a lot of different tools. Physical models is uh, of utmost importance for us, uh, as well as digital uh, design. Parametric design helps us to understand our geometries and optimize them. Um, simulations becomes more and more important for us. How can we, for example, create better microclimates around our uh, buildings? How can we uh, produce buildings more clever? Can we use materials even better? And we do a lot of, uh, use a lot of effort in research on that, as well as uh, behavior. But I think one of the most important things is obviously the studio culture and the people that are located either in Copenhagen, but also uh, in, in these other cities where we have offices. I think that the one thing, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on in, in this talk, but uh, you know, a, a usual kind of, um, a timeline in a project is that you get a, 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 a brief in and then you, you're going from A to B, essentially a, a finished building or something like that. Um, but how do we actually do that? And I think we, we, we see our development uh, with architecture as, as a kind of a, a series of uh, generations. We, we start every project with studies, uh, with study kind of all types of different possibilities some generations kind of lives on and some, you know, unfortunately has to die. Uh, some get paired with others. And, and this is just some, some, some uh, model boards of, a, for example, a project we did in Stockholm some years ago. It shows kind of a, a range of different approaches to what the building could be. Then we kind of start figuring out a, a couple of models that actually does something uh, really well. And then we develop a whole new generation out of those uh, models. And so goes the story. Then we kind of select a few more and, and develop it more and more. I think physical models is really, really good in terms of that you understand, you can grasp what you're, what you're doing, but there's, there's a lot of good things with, with working um, digitally as, as well. You can analyze the things you're doing very precisely early on in the process. Uh, you could create simulations. This is a particular, uh, example from from the fish market in Sydney, which we'll we'll touch on later, but essentially, you know, you could do quite detailed studies on solar radiation, uh, water, uh, densities of people, um, but obviously also 3D models enables us to have a quite detailed look on on, on how the building would actually appear. Um, and for example, this uh, this uh, uh, sketch here is uh, for the IOC headquarters, which we'll also talk a little bit about later, and it enables us to to quite uh, detailed understand how this building would, would look when it's finished. 
So thanks, Arjun. Yeah. So as as I've just spoken about, if the if the process and the ideal process at three XN is about you start with the concept and uh, you have a very clear singular outcome from that, which is as close to that concept as possible. Um, at uh, at GXN, we have a slightly different model where we don't always know what the outcome is going to be. So we have a starting idea or research question and the outcomes can be varied. It could be a piece of code, it could be a book, it could be design principles. But this, all these uh, wiggly lines here kind of uh, go to suggest that it's, uh, it allows us to experiment, to take risks before we scale up in the architecture itself. And we I kind of uh, like to describe us as being a bit of a Swiss army knife of knowledge and research. So what we're doing is that we're borrowing and, and, and stealing from various other uh, disciplines and fields from uh, uh, behavioral economics to psychology. Uh, and to do this, of course, we need to be diverse. And I think it's important to say that that's not only about diverse uh, uh, disciplines, uh, educations, but also in backgrounds and approaches. So we have, uh, as Peter mentioned at the beginning, three key focus areas. We have digital design, which includes things like simulations, parametrics, material science. We have circular design, uh, which really focuses on uh, climate change. And we have behavioral design. Uh, all of these fall under the umbrella of sustainability. And we think it's important to really specify uh, what those are. I'm going to concentrate mostly on circular design and behavioral design this evening. Uh, so just to give you a very quick uh, bit of background there, in terms of circular design, back in, oh, I think that was 2013, we published this book, which was really about taking the cradle to cradle principles and making those specific and tailored to the Danish construction environment. Uh, and one of the things we spoke about in that book, which by the way, I should say is open source and kind of intended as a bit of a, a manual uh, for the industry, uh, but one of the key principles, as many of you may know, in Cradle to Cradle is the separation of biological and technical materials. So never the twain shall meet. Uh, so after we'd done this book, we want to put these principles to the test. Uh, so we did one project, for example, where we looked at agricultural waste. How could we upcycle that? Uh, one of the materials we looked at were uh, the stems of tomato plants, which at the moment are just pure byproduct and how we could transform these into uh, materials, uh, surface finishes for interiors and other components. But following on from that and what we learned, we wanted to look at it in a bigger perspective, uh, in a systemic way, essentially. So we also carried out this research and, and made this publication, Building a Circular Future, that's 2018. And this was really motivated by, you know, this is a sort of snapshot of our construction process. It's very sleek, it's, it's extremely well controlled and uh, managed. But if you look at the other end of the life cycle, well, it tells quite a different story. It's something that's quite chaotic. So the book was split into three areas, design for disassembly, circular economy and material passport. I don't have time to go into those right now. But uh, again, from that research and learnings, we've then uh, carried out projects based on those principles. This one here is a circle house, which is a collaborative project about making social housing in Denmark circular. Uh, and then also a much larger scale. So for example, we are a specialist advisor in circularity to the city of Amsterdam. In terms of behavior, this is a much younger cluster. Um, and here, well, what, what I'm not, I don't want to talk too much about the slide, but what's important about it is to say that we're dealing with behavior at different scales. So from the individual, ensuring comfort levels at the social level, uh, ensuring that we create a sort of a stage set for good relations and also at the cultural level to do with uh, identity and values. As I say, it's a pretty uh, young fledgling uh, area of research for us, relatively speaking. So in this slide is really a, an, an ongoing uh, rolling document where we're trying to map out what does that mean uh, from looking at movement, wayfinding, uh, looking at connecting people, well-being, and of course, uh, sort of the human experience of buildings and, and what can we learn from the social sciences there. 
So for example, it might be about making design principles that really speak to our uh, intrinsic human needs and motivations. Or it could be something more specific about looking into a very much expanded notion of biophilia uh, beyond simply bringing plants into the building. Yeah, and I and I think I think what is important to us is that all of this that Susan just talked about is should be part of architecture as well. So it helps us essentially to qualify and to inform our uh, ideas and, and buildings. I think um, essentially every, every project, more or less every project at least, starts with some kind of brief. You know, it could be, you know, an office building, 20,000 square meters, and there's a kind of a description of what those square meters are. But I think to us, there's, there's more to it uh, than that. Uh, I think the, the first thing we do uh, when we, we, we get a brief and start on a project is look at other aspects. It could also be kind of the, the physical context around the project. Could that uh, inform it? But maybe even more importantly, uh, the cultural context. And I think as an example, working a lot in, in different countries, there's, for example, the, the, the idea of what private and public space is quite different, for example, in Denmark than it is in Toronto, where we are doing uh, uh, quite a few residential projects. So understanding the culture that you're working in and using that as a design driver is important. The climate, the climatic context is, 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 very, is very important as well. It, it comes sometimes, it just comes down to simple things that I just realized when I was the first time in Sydney that the sun comes from north, for example. <laughs> but, but obviously understanding which climate you're working in uh, is, is utmost uh, important for the, the project you're doing. Uh, could there, for example, also be stories to be told? Does the use of the building or the organization or whoever it is, is there a story that the building can actually uh, be designed around? Um, I think Peter mentioned the, the blue planet as part of that. And we, we don't have the, this in this presentation, but that was all about obviously creating the feeling of being underwater. Is there infrastructural challenges that needs to inform the project? Or uh, who are the users of the building? This is, this is, and this is maybe one of the most important ones. I, and I think we usually, it's, 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 it's pretty evident who is going to use the building on a day-to-day -day basis. But also they could be passive users, users that was not intended to, to actually interact with, with the project that we can activate. Could there be, for example, synergy between the, the, the program of the building and other programs on the site or within the project itself? Or are there particular constraints within the, the site itself we need to work with? And I think this, uh, this kind of forms what we would call a new brief. This is then the brief we would design uh, or propose our, uh, our uh, designs from. And it helps us um, kind of inform, again, the decision making uh, throughout these uh, generations that I mentioned um, earlier. And, and why is that important? And I think we, we believe that each project is, is unique. It actually matters if you're on the left or the right side of the road or, or something like that. And, and to, to ensure that uh, that, uh, that happens, we, you know, our design process um, and methodology must find those hidden potentials in each and every project. Architecture should always do more than it was intended to do in the first place. For example, this building here, it's a, it's a building we did in, in, in Molde in Norway, and it was a, it's a cultural building, but it ended up also being an, a, essentially a stage for a WENS. This is the jazz festival. At the same time, it works as a piece of infrastructure within the city, working as an extension of the, the main street uh, in the city itself. The arena in Copenhagen, obviously it works as a building that uh, you know, that, that works when this is the Sweden ice hockey match between Sweden and Denmark, I believe. But it should also be a good neighbor for the people that actually lives nearby, creating public spaces uh, that are attractive for them when the arena is not working. And that's the nature of an arena. It's all, it's sometimes it's calm and it should do something even then. A metro station in Stockholm, obviously it should take people from the metro and up to the street but it can also be a, 
a, a piece of urban furniture, essentially a place to sit and wait when you meet people. So it's a kind of an extension of the brief uh, and idea of, the, of a metro station. Another project in Stockholm, I think what we figured out in, in this particular case, uh, building in the historic center of Stockholm is that the building itself must be, be designed on the principles of what is there. So it's, it's a building that essentially transformed the, the sloping roofs of the, um, of the existing buildings into the vertical gables uh, that are that are um, inside these uh, courtyard blocks with, uh, in the city, as well as uh, a lot of studies on the materiality and how we can actually uh, uh, pick materials that 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 was already uh, had the texture and the kind of the historic sense of it. This building is is, is a very important building for us. It's it's a college here in Copenhagen. And what was important with this one was it was based on a new educational reform that, that came in the early 2000s. Uh, but no one had, had ever built a project that was based on those, uh, those new, that new reform. And essentially, in, in short terms, the reform stated that we should go from classroom-based education to project-based education. So we created this kind of model of these boomerang uh, floor slabs that essentially created an indoor uh, schoolyard a series of different learning spaces um, where you could both relax, but also learn and interact with the other students. And I think Susan, you have something to say about this building as well. Yeah, so stairs in general, I would say are a really important uh, element of our architecture. Um, and we like to say, you know, stairs connect more than floors. They also connect people. So our hypothesis, if you like, in this project was that this stair was going to be a social space. Um, but where are we right about that? This is where post-occupancy evaluations become important to us. And in fact, uh, we carried out a, P a PhD or uh, um, a, a social psychologist uh, worked with us um, to create this PhD. A big part of that was about going back to a number of our buildings that all had in common a really central, quite spectacular staircase with an atrium and seeing, well, how do they work in practice? Uh, so she carried out lots of uh, very detailed uh, field work, observations, um, interviews and so forth. And what she did here, and you can see a sample of, is how she starts mapping where people are, for how long, and importantly, what are they doing there? So through analysis of, analysis of this, uh, she could see that there were different reasons, apart from obviously circulation, that people were using the stair. Were they waiting for someone? Were they... Uh, looking to spot someone they know, or where they're stopping to chat, and so on. Uh, and one of uh, one of the key findings from these post-occupancy evaluations was that while the stair itself uh, plays an important role in terms of aesthetics and uh, inviting people to use it, it's the landings themselves that are incredibly important from a social point of view. And it's quite logical in a sense that you go up the stair, you meet someone, and you want somewhere that you can step aside to have a chat or you want somewhere that you can uh, stop and stare or wait without feeling uh, um, uncomfortable. So this idea of the importance of landings was a, was a key finding there. And this has been important to us because we've then transfer, transferred and transformed these findings into other projects. So for example, this is the IOC headquarters in Lausanne, which opened last year. Um, and we took these findings really seriously here and, and made them bigger, unfolded and expanded them. So the stair itself was very important from a symbolic view, from a sort of embodying the cultural values uh, of the Olympics, because the, we take the uh, five Olympic rings and transform it into these five separate circular stairs uh, moving up the building. But importantly, um, it also allows us to take the landings finding uh, and, and amplify that. So because of the circular nature of the stairs, one has to walk around to go up to the, the next story. Um, and that means then that the spaces in between, oh, sorry, let me just see if my slide is, yes, there we are, sorry. Uh, that then means that as you walk around, that what otherwise would be just a bit of pure circulation, a small landing space, becomes a space in and of its own right. Somewhere that people can wait, somewhere you can take some respite, 
Uh, and it also it really encourages people to move more as well. And we all know that movement is a, a key part of health uh, as well. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, this particular project is a, is, a, is a good example of how our kind of research and post occupancy studies of the college kind of informed the design process of how those internal spaces should be. Uh, but there was also an, other things with this project that was important to us. First of all, it's located in a park. Um, and what we really wanted to do was kind of this building to blend into the landscape and did a series of studies of what, what that could look like. Um, for us, it was, was all about integrating that, but also breaking down the scale. So essentially the first, the first floor uh, is kind of part of the landscape and the, the three upper floors are kind of standing on top of that plinth. And also for the IOC, IOC, the IOC essentially, it's all about movement. It's all about sports. And we wanted that to be kind of reflected within the geometry uh, of the building, but also kind of uh, creating good uh, uh, good workplaces and all of that, so it's a very kind of transparent uh, transparent building um, that has a lot of movement uh, in it. And here you see uh, parts of the landscape and how kind of that the building stands on top of the plinth. Um, in terms of the 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 actual geometry, uh, we did a kind of series of parametric studies with different parameters. This is looking at the, the cleaning, uh, how you could clean the double facade from within, uh, but also uh, uh, using our workflow to, to figure out uh, the, uh, uh, the most kind of pragmatic uh, way uh, to, to, to uh, have a facade within this, uh, within this shape. And it kind of created this building. Um, I, I should say that this, this is uh, the building to date that has scored the most uh, lead point uh, lead points in the office building. It's a highly sustainable building, um, and I think there's there's a kind of story to it as well that you can't really see, which is kind of important. And that is that we essentially reused more or less uh, all of the materials that were in the existing structure that was at the site, uh, using it in the slabs and the structure of the building itself. And this this is something that we are doing other places in the world. So now we going to go to Sydney, I think most people would know the building uh, to the left there, the, the Sydney Opera House, also done by a, a Danish architect some years ago. But here we are working, uh, currently building um, a, a, the uh, Key Quarter Tower in, in Key Quarter in Sydney. And this, what is interesting here was AMP invited for a competition where the the idea was that the, the structure of the building should be uh, kept and around that it should be created kind of a new office building extending the, the floor slab to the north. And uh, looking at the site, uh, essentially there's, there's, a, there's a building in front of us, but the lower part can actually see uh, another icon in Sydney, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and the top part uh, when you kind of are over the, the, the building in front, you can then have start to have views of the bay and, and the Sydney Opera House. And that is, was essentially what informed um, our diagram of this building, essentially a rotating uh, north elevation kind of facing the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And then when it comes up, uh, starts to look at uh, uh, to the north to the Sydney, uh, Sydney Opera House. In addition to that, we kind of broke the building down into to, to smaller uh, mid-rises, you could say, uh, creating uh, possibilities for outdoor spaces when you elevated outdoor spaces, but also breaks down the scale of the tower itself. And I think <laughs> there's, there's, there's a few things that is interesting with this building that you essentially can't see when it's finished but we are keeping uh, more or less all of the structural walls within the existing structure and, and, and then are building our concept around that. And this is some uh, photos of the, the, uh, the site uh, some months ago where you can see the, the new uh, building, the new structure um, closest by and the existing high rise uh, structures behind. And so how do you design a kind of a facade uh, around that? And one of the, the things we picked up is essentially the spacing between the existing structural columns, which are, which are kind of these frames and where the vertical pieces are, uh, are taking a lot of the um, east and west sun and the horizontal pieces are shading a lot for the, for the north uh, quite harsh sun in, in Sydney. So this strategy uh, had 
quite a lot of benefits. Uh, one being that it allowed us to save over seven and a half thousand tons of CO2. And it also had real monetary value as well. And that's not only because of the material savings, but also because of the time saved in terms of program and, and construction. One of the key things in the brief was that uh, the client wanted that when one arrived uh, out of the lift into a lobby, that there was uh, direct views out of these spectacular views that uh, Anton's just been talking about. And another key point was that this is a, a speculative office uh, development. So we didn't know, nobody knew who the end users or the tenants were going to be. Um, and so what this uh, led us to discuss was, well, tenants and users of different uses. Uh, organizations, companies can expand and contract. Maybe some want to have a four-story atrium, maybe some want two stories, maybe some want none at all. So how do we uh, afford that kind of uh, flexibility? I think, Susan, if I may just say one thing about that slide, if you go one, one more back, sure. I think one of the, the things we also discussed when we developed this project in terms of behavior is also to kind of address um, some of the kind of feeling of disorientation when you're in a tall building. Mm. Uh, and obviously it helped with, with kind of stacking of these boxes, uh, you know, creating essentially a series of ground floors. And once you kind of open up these atriums, uh, you, you start actually to, to, to see other people and to be visually connected with, with people that are on other floors. And it gives a complete different uh, uh, feeling and orientation of where you are. Mm. Um, and I think that was, uh, in terms of the behavior studies we've done, that was that was a huge kind of design driver for the for the for the concept as well. Yeah. So, so the, we we believed in the atria and certainly wanted that to be a possibility. So in order to enable this to facilitate this, we went back to our research I mentioned earlier about cradle to cradle, but also importantly designed for disassembly. Uh, some of the principles that we developed for this. We'd already had uh, quite a bit of experience in the area. Um, so we'd been studying all the different intersections because it's really designed for disassembly. So much of it is about these interfaces, right? Uh, between slab to slab, slab to floor, whatever that might be. Um, and we had a long standing and still do collaboration with PACO. Um, so we'd in collaboration then been developing, you know, in concrete reversible mechanical joints. Uh, also looking at that steel design for disassembly joints where, you know, you, you get rid of any of the sort of cementing in and the wet trays. But in this particular project, uh, we looked at this palette of ideas and came up with a really very simple, quite elegant solution, which was to allow these uh, soft spots for atria at the perimeter of the slab, just outside the lift lobbies. And these soft spots a number of important things. One is that they were all constructed out of standard steel elements, nothing bespoke uh, there. Number two, that uh, rather than any sort of welding, everything was spliced together. It was a uh, reversible joint, mechanical. And three, and perhaps most importantly of all, is that all of the steel pieces were sized to be able to fit in the regular goods lift. Uh, and what this means is that if a, if a tenant does want to remove or uh, an atrium or, or put one in, that the building doesn't have to shut down. There's no downtime whilst that happens. Everything can continue functioning as usual. And you can see uh, this is on site at this very moment. And just to bring it back round, really, I mean, what this does is it allows us to have spaces like this. Now, this is important because it allows for this flexibility and tenant choice, user choice. But as Adam was mentioning, we really did believe in the importance of allowing uh, for these HR to exist uh, because we know what this means for encouraging knowledge sharing, social interactions and well-being in terms of daylight and so forth as well. So I think what's quite interesting about this project is I mentioned at the beginning, we have these three focus areas, digital behavior circular. And what you can see here is that this is a, uh, we're now talking about the overlap between the behavioral and the circular in this case. And, and for us, that's where there's a lot of real uh, uh, meaty stuff to be uh, investigated and developed. Yeah, yeah and I, I think, I think if, if we just go back one, one slide there, I, I would also like to say that this, this project essentially 
is also starting to talk about um, vertical flexibility uh, in office buildings. Whilst we, I think we've been talking for decades about horizontal flexibility, whilst uh, this, this project is trying to actually do it in both ways, both obviously horizontally, but also vertically, being able to connect floors or disconnect floors while tenants move in or move out or their needs change over time. Uh, and I think that is one of the key points to actually have building be standing there and be relevant for a long time. Uh, which the existing high rise essentially in, in, in this particular case, it was a very good structural uh, uh, building, therefore it can be reused. And I think we should, we should try to design our buildings uh, for, those, uh, for those certain uh, types of, um, of situations in the future, because eventually the least sustainable thing you can do is build a building and tear it down a couple of years after. And um, I think some of the some of the, the the ideas of the behavior is something that we've we've taken uh, with us as well to to London here uh, at the two Finsbury Avenue part of the the Broadgate uh, Broadgate campus um, and we're very excited to to be to be working on a project in London um, uh, alongside our client British Land uh, and and it's it's it it has truly been a fantastic experience I think. Um, and I think one of the, the one of the initial ideas when we were uh, approached by them to to come with our kind of take on this project was to say that when when we look at this project, we kind of spanning in different scales. Obviously, the uses of the building here it, we need to kind of create uh, differentiated uh, and 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 good workplaces, but also look into how we can kind of uh, within this building create a kind of a campus feeling as well as being part of a kind of a larger, greater area in the London skyline. And, and one of the quite, I think, fun uh, investigations we did, did in the beginning was looking at how kind of people uh, see the campus in itself. And it was clear to us that there was a lot of uh, different qualities and activities happening there. And, and if we then kind of look at what, what a campus is, a campus is essentially kind of a series of buildings connected with public spaces or social spaces or green spaces. And... And what we really wanted to do was kind of translate those qualities uh, into um, a building. So, so the building is kind of based on a principle that it's, it's, it's a series of, of uh, connected volumes with spaces in between where, where people can do other things or interact or social spaces. And it kind of arrives at, uh, sorry, at this, uh, this, uh, this volume here where we are starting to, we have created a building that starts to kind of show off its activity. Um, the, it's, it, it, it reads as a building where we are highlighting certain areas in the building that something different is happening. And, and in that sense, it becomes kind of a, a vertical campus, you could say. Um, the building offers, you know, from, from outdoor areas to indoor social spaces to, to uh, winter gardens, you know, essentially exterior spaces that we can use um, uh, throughout the year uh, as well. So, so again, it, it, it starts to kind of address some of the uh, repetitive um, ideas of a kind of a typical, for example, a tall building where we are start to differentiate uh, these, uh, these, uh, these floors. And, and most importantly as well, uh, the, in this particular case, I don't think we're talking about soft spots anymore. I think we're talking about hard spots. So, all of the structure needs to be flexible to be disassembled or reconnected mm -hmm. again. So GXN were uh, separately commissioned by British Land uh, to carry out research across behavior and circularity. And um, they had very high ambitions and, and a really big vision for what this building could be and what it could do. So in order to, to satisfy those ambitions, we began by carrying out a white paper, which is something we do quite a lot of, uh, into what are some of the most sustainable buildings in the world? Uh, what, you know, what makes them work? How do we compare and study those? And one of the findings from that white paper was this uh, pyramid here on the right, where essentially we're saying, yes, certifications are the bedrock, and yes, green solutions are, are, are the way of uh, achieving those certifications. But what really sets aside these state-of-the-art buildings is the top of this, these unique stories 
where we start to see sustainability not just as something aspirational but as something experienced as part of the narrative and driver of the design. So alongside this research we uh, facilitated a whole series of workshops. This was also uh, deep in corona time here so it was, uh, everything was done online um, and during these workshops we had many different people, uh, clients out there representing different uh, areas of expertise. We had engineers, we had uh, digital infrastructure, we had a whole load of people coming there. And what this was all about was really trying to understand what are the values behind the client, uh, what are their big aspirations, and how can we start to um, highlight, how can we start to identify what these unique stories should be. Uh, in parallel to all of this, we looked into what's essentially future studies or, or futurology, where we've spoken already about the importance of a building that can flex and is resilient to a changing uh, environment, a changing context. So uh, what we did here was uh, scenario planning, which uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with, which is where we sort of looked at different versions of a future world in which this building will be placed in order to then backcast and say, okay, what do we need to embed into this architecture right now in order to be sure that it can respond to these uh, contexts? And as you can see here, that covered from uh, looking at quite uh, radical circularity, beyond biophilia, looking at uh, the digital side of things as well and next-gen smart and new guilds, which is really about this idea of uh, a, a, um, a very developed idea of social relations. And these scenarios, uh, in order to, to come to these, rather than just uh, like uh, on this first slide, it's not about them falling from a tree, but we carried out uh, studies, so across different sort of categories, whether that's socioeconomics, demographics, resources, so we're not just looking trends within our own industry. And then uh, the y-axis there is looking at, you know, what are past weights, what are our, our present pushes, and so forth. So these are drivers for a scenario. So, for example, these could be anything from, this is from 2018, I believe, Greenwich Park in London, where all the grass uh, was burned off because of essentially climate change and, and leading to drought. Outside of science, it could also be a policy push. This document here issued by the Mayor of London, where uh, circular economy statements become an, an essential part of the process. And also about changing consumer de demands, consumer desires, and a uh, changing sort of aesthetic of uh, sustainability. So once we have these scenarios, what we looked at then was, well, what does that mean? Well, what does that tell us that we ought to uh, do in terms of design? So we separated it down into different categories and then subcategories, sort of strategies, if you like, uh, beyond that. And so, uh, you know, just to go back to this idea about the sort of unknown or non-deterministic model of what the outcome of this project is, um, we then developed further these uh, strategies into a, I suppose you could call it a, a kind of a catalogue or a, a whole smorgasbord of ideas for each of these scenarios, which we are then still in continual discussion with the client about how do we prioritize these? How do we uh, find out which ones are most important and uh, that we want to further develop? Yeah, and I, and I think so, uh, I think Peter mentioned it a little bit in his introduction. So for example, in this project, <clears throat> we, uh, 3XN uh, has had their scope and GXN has been all involved as a kind of sustainability uh, advisor. Uh, and that is kind of one setup that we, we uh, sometimes work in. Um, the last project we're going to talk about is a slightly different setup. Here it has been a kind of uh, 3XN and GXN providing kind of the, 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 the normal scope of a project. But this project is a uh, you could say highly complicated scope in terms of there's a lot of stakeholders. This the client is uh, uh, New South, the state of New South Wales. Uh, the city of Sydney has a lot of um, stake in it as well, and obviously the Sydney fish market, which essentially I think consists of 80 different uh, uh, stakeholders in itself. So 
using uh, uh, our studies on, for example, behavior, but also uh, um, um, program synergies, um, technical solutions in terms of sustainability has been uh, extremely important in the process of designing this project. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it now. And, and um, the, the, for those of you that have been in Sydney or maybe visited the existing Sydney fish market, it's, it will still be located in Blackwater Bay. We'll find a new place in the, in the, in the bottom of Blackwater Bay, essentially located on top uh, of water. Um, what is interesting with the market itself is that it's not a purpose-built building, though. It's an old paper factory, and this is essentially what you see when you, when you uh, arrive. It's, it's a very dangerous <laughs> task to actually enter the Sydney fish market. Uh, there's trucks everywhere. Uh, uh, load, the loading dock is right next to the entrance. And so when we kind of studied the existing fish market, we, from the outside, it was not especially inviting, but what is happening inside fish markets, it's an exhibition in itself. There's more than 500 species of fish and seashells and everything uh, in that. So, so the, the, what is inside in the building is, is, is so interesting. Um, so we then kind of looked at what is a typical fish market typology. Essentially, it's a box that is super hard to get to, but once you're inside, it's, 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 it's a fantastic experience. Uh, so what we really wanted to do with this project was to open that function up and blend it in together with the public realm and, and blurring the boundaries uh, between the building and the city itself. Going back to the brief, there was not much talk about that. It was essentially, I, it was one of the shortest brief I've ever read. It was two A4 papers saying it should be a new world-class fish market and then some, some specifications on the areas. But I think that was deliberately from uh, Urban Growth, uh, our client, uh, because what they really wanted to, to find out was that uh, which teams could kind of uh, uh, create a design that could live throughout the process of, of designing this building. It has, people have tried before and not succeeded. And what we really figured out was that it should do much more than just being a fish market. In the broader context, it should definitely connect the water and the city. Um, and uh, but also another kind of uh, uh, thing that is quite important it should uh, have a building that could accommodate both for an industrial function to work alongside a more leisure oriented uh, a public function and that is a brave move i think from sydney <laughs> is to keep one of their industrial functions at the the, the waterfront um, Usually industry moves out of these cities, uh, but here we have a, an industrial working fish market alongside, alongside um, uh, a big retail uh, restaurant area. And those two uh, functions need to work together, not in conflict. It should, this building should uh, and could have the possibility of also creating a new public anchor along the Sydney Harbour front. And more importantly, it should also connect and, and contribute to uh, not only me that usually would, would be there for work or as a tourist, uh, but, but create good uh, conditions for the, the workers at the market or the customers that the restaurants that comes in and, and, and buys fish for their, uh, uh, at the wholesale, um, but also the local residents, you know, um, maybe it's a place that you don't, can be uh, even though you really don't like sushi or something like that. And, and that was our ambition uh, for the design. So it becomes this idea of a building that maybe could work as a connector itself. And this is kind of the, the, uh, the final design. They, they started um, uh, uh, at the site here in August and we're super excited about that. It, it's a building that is essentially, it's partially landscape, partially building, you could say. It, a roof that cover, covers all of these different stakeholders that is within the market. Uh, the, the industrial fun functions, but also the, the waterfront promenade and, the, and all the restaurants and, and retailers. Stairs that essentially becomes a more than just getting from A to B, but becomes a, a public space in itself, a, a place to sit and interact with the, with the activity at the, at the waterfront. Um, a water edge that is accessible for the people of Sydney 24-7. And this is, this is not the case today at this location. 
and that is one of the was one of the uh, most important thing for us was to make that waterfront edge accessible, even though we are talking about a quite large industrial function located here. So it's elevated above. It creates, uh, even though it kind of splits the in industrial and uh, function and the, and the public realm apart here, you can see the, the, the promenade, how it's elevated above you. We still maintain the kind of visual connection, create, maintains the authenticity of what the market is all about. And that is essentially the, the, the auction and the loading of fish and, and, and goods. Standing inside the space, I think it was important for us to, to have a roof that could bring in daylight. We wanted to create a market feel. Uh, but when we would design these buildings, um, and it, pushed, uh, it, it go, goes back to some of the... the the, uh, the points that Susan made about circular design. It's all about looking at the life cycles of these, these different uh, building parts, but also who occupies them. So the roof, that will always be there. We will all, we always know there will be rain, there will be sun, there will be wind. Um, but what happens under, retailers will change. They will grow, they will retract, they will come in new, uh, new tenants and so on and so on. So therefore the entire structure under this roof is uh, designed for this assembly. It can be changed over time, moved around. Uh, and, and I don't think if, if we didn't have that concept within this building, the building would not be relevant as well in the future. So essentially we designed a, a, a concept that under this roof, it's a kind of a series of modular systems that could potentially accommodate a lot of different activities from more kind of recreational oriented uh, spaces to, to more uh, kind of typical restaurant uh, spaces. Odin's spoken about this being really a piece of civic architecture. So, you know, there's, there's retail, there's industry, there's cultural. Um, so what we really wanted to take very seriously is how to signal and how to attract people and invite them into this uh, as a piece of uh, the urban realm, essentially. Uh, so what you can see here on this slide are a number of what we call social affordances, which actually was something that also came out of uh, a PhD, um, whereby we look at uh, ideas like a uh, variety of scale, about sensorial uh, stimulation, about connection between inside and out and so forth, um, so that we could be sure that this building was really communicating with all the different user groups as, uh, and inviting them to take part in this experience. We also looked, you know, there's a, there's a sort of critical mass you need for, of people to be visitors in order to make a building feel lively, in order to have, you know, have that buzz um, that, that does um, make it part of, uh, of a cultural experience. Um, so what we did then was also a very different sort of simulation from the solar and wind that you often consider. So here we looked at different times of day and different seasons. What were the projected figures of visitors? And from this then ran a density simulation, I guess you could call it, for these different populations to see was it going to be on one hand either too busy or too empty uh, and how could we design uh, for this the, the right sort of critical mass of uh, crowds. And I think, and I would correct me here if I'm wrong, what this led to was us actually suggesting and the client agreeing to reduce the footprint of the building by 25, 30 percent. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. I think I think we while studying actually the density and the number of people that would be there at a certain times of day, we together with the client figured out that the building should actually be smaller than it was intended to. to mm. And I would argue that that is actually a quite sustainable way. Of developing a project because yeah, absolutely. no the one material. no one should build a no one should build a project that is not fit for its for its use uh, and it's a, it's a it's a quite easy script this one but it's it's a very visual script uh, you know just to populate your 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 models with the number of people projected mm. so also thinking about the how the the life of this building and how to again squeezed every last drop of value out of it, uh, was driven by this. Um, this is the fish market opening, the auction hall opening, which starts at 3 a.m. and finishes at something like midday. 
So we then investigated, okay, how can we make sure that these spaces have multiple lives at different times of day? So a version of round the clock design, but it's important from the point of view of getting the most value out of the spaces and the architecture, but also by ensuring that these different user groups do come together, that there's different reasons to go there uh, for different sorts of people at different times of day. So it really becomes part of the city in that sense. So whether that's uh, market events or uh, cinema screenings, JAWS, I think you can see there in the bottom slide, um, that was important for us as well. So making the architecture work really hard and be flexible in its use. And what this allows us to do, I really like this slide, because you can see here that we have parallel worlds that usually wouldn't meet, but here they are coming together because of the architecture, because of the transparency and the flexibility of that. And this preserves the authenticity of these worlds from, from retail to uh, the, uh, uh, the auction house and the fish market itself. And this is incredibly important, that, that authenticity uh, in terms of creating and sustaining a culture. Yes, and <clears throat> I think we're getting to the end here, luckily. There's a lot of slides. Um, I would just quickly like to, to, to talk a little bit about the, the roof and the design principles of that. It taps into that what we, should, what we what design should do more than one thing. And obviously this, this roof does a lot of things, but it's, it, it, what it really does, it shades for the sun, of course, but it brings a lot of daylight in as well. And, and, and when we studied markets around the world, historic markets, new markets, it's all about creating a feeling that you're outside. So actually bringing a lot of daylight in was uh, of utmost importance for us, but also natural air. And again, um, you can design a lot of technical solutions, uh, but when we received the brief, I believe uh, more or less all of the retail area was air conditioned. But actually by designing this roof using natural ventilation as a design driver, we were able to reduce the, those areas that were air conditioned drastically uh, by 60%, I believe. And that is quite a bit of energy saved. Obviously, we are using the, the roof as an energy uh, producer in itself, uh, using PVs. So that is part of the design as well. It always also harvests all the water that falls on top of it in, in, in a kind of series of, of uh, points. And that helps because of the actual shape of the, the roof itself. The fish market is it's a huge consumer of water. Every day, even though it doesn't rain much in Sydney, Every day, the fish market uses water to clean their areas um, in the wholesale, in the, in the, the more industrial part, but also at the retail floors. And we created some kind of synergy between that water flow and uh, public uh, spaces around the building. So this is a green space right next to it that actually gets water from the fish market, cleans it, and then lets it out to the bay. But it also helps the plants survive and grow uh, during the year. So as kind of final comment about this building, it, it brings in to get a lot of the research we've done from behavior to simulations um, to circularity into one design that eventually hopefully will connect the city uh, with the water and uh, finally create a new public anchor uh, for the uh, visitors of Sydney, but also for the local residents. And I think that was our talk, wasn't it, Susan? I think it is. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much, um, Alden and, uh, and Susan. Uh, that final project, I guess, is, um, I mean, it's a fantastic culmination of everything you have been talking about in terms of the areas of research and the, the preoccupations of the, of the practice over the years. Um, We've got one or two questions that have been um, emailed in, um, but I would just like to start with uh, a little bit more of an understanding of how the research works in collaboration with the design work in the practice. And in particular, I suppose, I, I'm gonna put two or three questions to you and you can, you can answer them in any way you like, but I, I'm interested in what, what your relationships are with academic institutions, because I, having been involved with research projects with universities and schools of architecture, et cetera, it seems to me that they often work to a very longer timetable, time scale, or time span than, than our <coughs> projects, which uh, work very fast. Um, but 
you doing academic research projects it allows you to kind of think in depth about something that actually a project because of the speed and constraints probably doesn't allow you to think about so i'm interested in 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 how you work with academic institutions and whether you also do um refereed research work um validated research work and research papers and whether you actually contribute directly to research within universities so there's several questions together there about the academic the links to academia i'll do my best uh let me know if i forget any uh sub questions yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question and I entirely agree about the different speeds and timeframes uh, between industry and academia and we are really very much bridging between these two worlds. So we collaborate with the academic world in a number of ways. I'd say maybe the two most important. One of them is teaching, as many architects do. Um, we find it incredibly important uh, to run studios, master studios usually, and this is across the world that we do this, it sort of changes every couple of semesters. Um, and that kind of uh, what one might call research through education, uh, we do find an important model for testing out ideas, experimenting. Um, but something that's very unique to Denmark, I believe, is the industrial PhD model. So what this is, is that instead of, like, I have an old fashioned PhD where it was just me and the academic institution, but an industrial PhD adds an, an extra partner to that, an industrial partner, and, and GXN uh, has a number of times and continues to be the industrial partner. Now, what this allows us to do is to take a PhD or indeed a postdoc, to do very in-depth, deep dive, long-term academic projects, where we are also a part though, of setting up the research questions of, of, of contributing to the outcomes and the methods. Um, so for example, at the moment we have three running, uh, one at, uh, with Bartlett in London and a couple here at the Royal Academy in Copenhagen. Um, and we find it an incredibly important counterbalance to much of our faster, purely uh, industrial research. Um, and of course, through that, absolutely doing peer reviewed research and uh, uh, writing papers, which we do do as well outside of that model. But, but that's, uh, that allows us, I think it's a really uh, good, as I say, counterweight to the much more fast paced uh, work that we do as well. And so we get these learnings over a long period of time and then feed these into uh, our work. Maybe Susan, if I can add a little bit in terms of the dynamic between GXN and 3XN in that sense, mm. because I write, I'm right, I think you're right, Peter, there are different types of pace here. Uh, you know, working on a project, for example, you have your deadlines, you have your stages that you need to go through. Um, and it's really hard actually to do research in that environment. That is one of the reasons that GXN uh, is their own entity in the office. Mm. Because I, I think in the more deadline-oriented uh, uh, environment, it's really hard to not know where you're going. Um, so GXN in that, in that sense works as a kind of a knowledge base. We can always uh, uh, pull them into a project and use their knowledge and, 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 and use their, uh, um, obviously, different types of backgrounds in a project to contribute. And I think when we... I, I will always remember this because when we presented the, when we down for, and, and, and pitched for the Sydney fish market, we had um, a project, a, a presentation that was way too long, obviously. Uh, we were, we had, I think we had like 250 slides and we had 50 minutes and it was, it was so much uh, in there, but essentially 50% of it was not about architecture at all. It was about all other aspects of what this building should do. And I think the jury chairman, he said in the end, thank you very much. That was a very intense experience. <laughs> and we thought we've lost it. But I think actually that's why we won it. Uh, because uh, I think, as we see it, architecture is mo much more than uh, some walls and a columns and a roof. It should do much more than that. And I believe our research and our uh, curiosity of uh, possibilities within projects, but also within the academia is, is contributing to that. So... I can see that what must have been quite infectious to sort of uh, have that, have that, all of those ideas presented, um, uh, and it obviously worked for you. 
Um, just following up a little bit about the relationship between GXN and 3XN, I'm interested, um, I mean, from, our own ex from my own experience, whenever we say, um, whenever I talk to people in the practice and say we'd like to do some research work on this, you know, hands shoot up all over the place amongst, particularly amongst the recent graduates and whatever. They, there's a, there's a, a real uh, keenness to get involved in research uh, associated with design. Mm -hmm. um, am I right in saying that uh, the, the employees, put it that way, of GXN are different to the employees of 3XN? Do you, do you share people? Do you have, um, I mean, does one organization buy research, does the, does the practice buy research from the research group? Or, uh, I mean, how, how, does, how does that, how does it work from a business management and personnel management perspective? I think in terms of uh, different sorts of people, I will happily admit that our, us GXNers are the nerds and the geeks and, you know, the misfits <laughs> is wow, that's um, not correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, maybe, well, maybe Adam, you want to say something a bit about how uh, uh, we'd be just asking about if you buy research from us and, and that kind of mechanism. Well, I so obviously so GXN and 3X are separate companies so they are kind of methods uh, into that in terms of our it's one umbrella presumably it's one umbrella that's correct. Uh, in terms of the the, the actual uh, work and who's on each project, it depends a little bit on that type of project. Mm -hmm. So, for example, on the on uh, the the fish market, we uh, and that is the world of architecture. You know, you get a scope of services. You have to do this and this and this. And many of these things are not described in that. But uh, we had three people from GXN working full time on that project from the beginning. So there, in, in that sense, you could say the, the, the team of architects delivering the scope of services for that particular project was a bl completely blended group. If we go to the project in, in London, for example, GXN has their own contract where they contribute on more of the sustainability, working as more of a disruptor in that sense, <laughs> and sometimes working against us, uh, if I might say it like that. Mm. Um, so then, then it works completely differently. Uh, but I think we as an organization needs to be agile in that in, in that way uh, yeah. and that's the idea of it so it's it's not a clear answer essentially peter it's it's, mm -hmm. it's working both uh, uh separate but also together when that makes sense i like I that say, nerds as well as disruptors yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that should be our new title <laughs> i will say you know it does i agree it's very much a case-by-case -case scenario so usually i mean we work very closely together we're all under one roof we have long established ties so uh, we're very much in bed with each other in that way, but I would say that as a project comes in, you know, we meet, we discuss how could GXN best contribute here. And, and some projects is a very clear role for us and others it might take uh, uh, not such a big role or the client might take more convincing. So well, yeah, we find it's just important, the communication between us and being aware of uh, possibilities and capabilities. It's and you are, a, you are as GXN a a separate cost center, and so you actually have your own contracts with the clients usually. Or do you, do you, if uh, the client is unwilling to pay, do you actually just do the research for, for the, the project anyway? I mean, how, how does that work? Well, we are a separate uh, legal entity and a separate cost center, as you say. Um, so on some projects, essentially, uh, 3XN um, set aside hours for us. But it's still, you know, it's, it's a 3XN contract that they're then asking us to contribute to. Yeah. Um, and other times that's uh, very much separate and we're pitching separately uh, as an additional service uh, on top of that. So again, there isn't a really a clear cut answer, but there, there are different ways of doing it. And I certainly would say that we find ourselves having to be very flexible yeah. and to kind of, uh, you know, and do that dance and uh you know find different ways of uh of collaborating mm. well you and and just one thing maybe there Peter, is that gxn is also collaborating with other architects yeah. on other projects um and are doing their separate research projects of course um yeah uh, so, so so that's kind of the another 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 part of that story uh true and we also consult for not just other architects but other uh, clients separately, you know, completely separately, and also for, I mentioned, for example, Keiko, 
We've also mm. worked with lighting companies, with different municipalities and governmental uh, bodies. So maybe it, it goes up and down, but maybe roughly half our work is directly is with 3XN and right. half of it's independent. So you are, you are on the lookout for other research projects as well. For instance, the, the tomato husks project. Yes, so yes. That's from, a, from a different route completely, presumably, it's a material. Yes, we do. And we have a number of research projects at the moment, uh, which are EU funded or the Innovation Foundation in Denmark funded, which are very much collaborative, mm -hmm. but with various other partners and, and not necessarily 3XN. Can, can I move on to uh, um, issues around energy and embodied energy? I mean, I was amazed when you said, I think it was AIC building, that you uh, looked at what was there and you managed to reuse 93% of mm -hmm. existing materials. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, I mean, we are only just getting around to thinking about this as a profession. And I think it's, uh, it, you know, it's great to have examples like that and also like the the work that you did on the, the sort of extension to the tall building in sydney but um do you uh, do you actually when you're asked to look at a site or with an existing building there do you do a, a thorough evaluation of the embodied carbon content of the materials and you measure what is there and see how you can use it or for it, on, mm. on that particular building d d did you actually say okay well this is what we have available to us how can we use it? Was that, a, was that the constraint on the new design? You, you could say that we will, we will like to do, uh, if there's a building there already, a kind of a pre-demolition audit where we actually map out the existing building, um, which parts make sense to reuse, which, which don't. Because it's 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 all comes from a pragmatic place, though. Like obviously, we would like to reuse as much as possible, but sometimes it doesn't really make sense. Um, so, so that would be a really good starting point. Uh, where, where, um, and I think, I think there it, it, again, it's a joint effort, both from three XN and GXN. Uh, it's mm -hmm. for example, circularity is a good example where some of our um, uh, 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 project architects that are more into details would help along in terms of uh, these uh, technical solutions and so on. Um, sure. So that will, that will always be, uh, I would say, the preferred starting point um, and, um, and, and map out what, what is there that can be, that can be reused. And, but there's different ways of doing it. For example, in IOC, uh, most of it went into the, the slabs of the building, for example. Uh, yeah. While uh, in um, in Sydney, the facade essentially on that tower did not perform uh, anything near what it should uh, should do. Therefore, that had to be taken down. Whilst the tr structure was really good, so mm -hmm. therefore it makes sense to obviously not reuse the facade, but reuse as much as possible of the existing concrete structure. And I think that is just a reminder for all of us that when we built buildings, we should think about the life cycles of the elements that we are creating. So that can be possible to do in the future as well. well that also links to the, 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 the discussion that you, the, you offered us about the, um, the, the prefabrication elements, the small elements of steel that went into constructing the, uh, I think it was in the, in the uh, board gate building. And uh, uh, one of the questions that we had, very pragmatic question, is how do you actually um, deal with fire codes and fire escape, et cetera, if, you, if you're constantly changing the layout of the existing buildings? I think there was, there was some confusion there from one of our, our um, viewers as to how that worked. Yeah, in, so the, the, the yeah, this, this, the, the, um, the, the example that Susan talked about was in our AMP tower in Sydney. Oh, um, obviously, this, the egress stairs would always take care of the, 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 those requirements. But for example, in Sydney, there is a requirement in terms of number of square meters that have been connected via an atrium in terms of uh, fire code. So some of the upper floors of those atriums are englazed uh, mm -hmm. because of that. Um, so obviously that's a very important aspect to it. Uh, and, and fire codes, as you all probably know, is very different from country to country. I think in, mm -hmm. in Stockholm, we built a building that was one 
fire compartment on 35,000 square meters, all interconnected with atriums. Um, so it's, it's all about being clever of the kind of the skeleton of the building and where those egress they are located. So you could, uh, so, so you could essentially um, develop the building from there. But those, for example, those soft spots, that they will not work as an egress stair in that sense. There will just be a, connect, a, a visible stair connector that will be used on a kind of everyday basis uh, between floors. Okay, I, I, uh, we're getting towards the time when we must conclude, but I, I have a, a couple more questions about, um, about the, uh, how one measures energy performance. I mean, we, the RIBA has come out with the, uh, its 2030 challenge, which is, uh, stipulates targets that for uh, both the embodied energy and the operational energy of different building typologies in now, 2020, 2025, and 2030, and um, the 2030 targets, which we are all aiming for, are really uh, quite stringent, quite tricky to meet, particularly in the uh, operational, in the, in the embodied energy side. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the question I have, I suppose, for you is, uh, you mentioned the uh, lead rating on the Sydney building, and, um, and we also have RIAM in this country, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think, my feeling is that those targets are now lagging way behind in mm -hmm. terms of what we need to be doing in order to meet the challenge, the climate challenge of, of staying below 1.5 degrees global warming. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, do you, uh, within, the, within your own organization or with engineering collaborators, undertake really comprehensive analysis of embodied energy in your buildings and do you actually also um, measure operational energy and, and, and go back and do it as a post-occupancy post evaluation exercise and if so what what um, methodologies do you use and what targets are you aiming for? I think uh, certainly LCA uh, life cycle analysis is an area that we are working with um, often in collaboration with, with engineers, uh, but we do also have uh, people trained in that in-house too. Um, because it just does become increasingly more important, you know, to move away. The operational energy has to be prioritized, particularly until we're in a situation in, uh, where it's, uh, where we've moved away from fossil fuels towards renewables, but the embodied energy uh, is now where it's at. That's going to be where we move on to next. Um, so we can see that as a success to some point when we start deciding that. Um, but what we do sometimes find is that whilst I think most people would agree that an LCA approach is critical, that the procurement and tendering and basically the, the market um, criteria and um, success criteria aren't up to speed yet on that. So, you know, it does become, of course, within uh, certification systems, some, many of them are asking for this now. Um, but, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, in terms of uh, choosing a tenderer and, and how, how, how that's measured is sometimes lagging behind. And that can be really problematic. Mm -hmm. um, so even if everyone in the room knows that, the, that LCA matters, it's just not something, you know, within that, that list of uh, success criteria quite yet. I think the RIBA awards system are cha is changing so that actually um, awards won't be given and for two or three years post completion so that post occupancy data will be included. Yes, which is incredibly important. You know, this yeah. performance gap is quite mm -hmm. terrifying in many ways mm -hmm. uh, when you look at how big that can be and how consistent that gap is as well. Um, so yeah, again, as, as you're rightfully saying, that role of post-occupancy evaluations just grows. And I think as an industry, we have historically been so terrible about going back and reviewing and analyzing our buildings, not only in terms of uh, technical performance, but in terms of, as I spoke about earlier, uh, how they're used, how they're perceived um, uh, in terms of behavior. So it's something in Denmark in general, and we're certainly uh, on that bus uh, to push this idea of post-occupancy evaluations, both to 
to do a better job, to add more value, but also to be able to communicate uh, why architecture really does matter and how it can have such a huge influence. And in Denmark, do you have uh, the results of those POA surveys uh, as kind of open source? Have you, have, is there a culture where people do share the data uh, from their buildings, albeit, as we all know, our buildings quite often fail to meet targets, but it's useful to know that they feel to fail to meet targets and absolutely yeah. shouldn't actually be too embarrassed and concerned about putting that data out in public. Is that something that you do in Denmark? I think it is much more open here. I don't know if I think maybe you'd agree with that, Arjun, but one thing I would say is that the, the Danish um, uh, dance art, I don't know how to translate that, the sort of association of Danish architects employer side, they've recently been doing a fantastic job about publishing POA data mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know being very uh, measurable and quantifiable in the impact that it's had. Uh, and I think that's very important. Uh, uh, stage and a role for such organizations to take. Oh, it, it's also fair to say that, you know, sometimes we don't control that information. Mm. Um, mm. Okay, yeah. the, 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 the client would, would usually be, uh, if it's not working, not interested in those numbers coming out. So, so unfortunately, we're not always in control of that ourselves. Um, <clears throat> having said that, I do think it's very important. Mm. So one last question, and just have you got any idea? I mean, you, as you mentioned, the embodied energy is the key to uh, uh, you know, reducing the carbon emissions to climate that, that are going to lead to climate change. And have you got any, any interesting research ideas that you're working on in terms of how to minimize the carbon content of concrete, which is the material we're all in love with and we need but is horrendously polluting. Um, and are there, apart from very, very lean design, is there anything that you're working on that you're prepared to share with us that actually will help us get over this horrendous problem that we have? Well, uh, I'm not sure how much I can share. I can say that we are part of a, an ongoing research project called Circle House Lab. Uh, I briefly mentioned a sister project to it about the circular social housing. And one of, not us directly, but one of our partners on that project or collaborators is looking very seriously into, you know, recycled aggregates and so forth in mm. concrete itself. Mm. Um, but we do also, you know, we really believe in quite a pragmatic hybrid approach um, where we're trying to, you know, reduce the amount of concrete as possible. So for example, through timber construction, as I say, often these have to be hybrid, so there's some concrete or some steel in there. Um, so we're really trying to take that uh, a approach also with the urban mining and upcycling, um, so how we can make the concrete more circular uh, in the future as well. So there's various things there. Yeah, I think you I think you showed some images of that, Susan. I think that is, uh, I. I yeah, you talked a little bit about the ex, ex, you know the the actual material, but essentially how. And that's something that we are really trying to push for here in Denmark, where where concrete is such a strong. Uh, <laughs> you, you talk about the concrete mafia essentially over here, um, <laughs> but where they are not super good at is essentially to uh, investigate in how to make these elements um, designed for disassembly. And obviously, that has a huge impact on the embodied carbon, where you could start to reuse these uh, these concrete elements. So concrete is a fantastic material. Uh, it just needs to be um, the lifespan of these elements needs to be, uh, be much longer than they sometimes are. Mm -hmm. um, and also, obviously, on each project we are starting. So, for example, I'm working on a project in Toronto where we are building a, a, a timber a, a office building in timber, which is going to be, the, I think, the tallest in in Canada um, in with a timber structure. But when, when we looking at the structure principles of that building, it doesn't really make sense to make the core in timber. The, the, the core will, will be there for so long. It's such a stabilizing element. And had to do that in timber, it would be much, much bigger. And it would have all kinds of cross bracings in the facade that will take a lot of the daylight. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's, it's embodied, when working with embodied carbon, <laughs> especially the structural uh, components of the building that, that takes up a lot of that, we just need to be pragmatic and where where does it make sense to for example use 
uh, timber, as for an example, or, or mm. not. I think also if I'm just one short additional comment is that I believe in Denmark anyway, there's something like 89% of uh, of uh, a construction after demolition is recycled, which sounds fantastic. Um, but actually, if you look at that, it's only 2% of the value that is retained because most of the time we're downcycling, we're crushing that up, it's going into aggregates, uh, road fill, whatever. So really, I think it's key to think about value, not just volume. So how can we retain the value in this, and as Adam's uh, uh, saying there, so that they can go on and have new lives at a component level. Um, so it was not always about uh, downgrading the materials there. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, you know, the, the, it's, to me, it's the most interesting stuff that you've said all evening is about this circular economy, about mm. recycling uh, the value in our buildings, not just the materials. Um, I think uh, I, I could we could go on a lot longer and I would really enjoy the conversation. <laughs> but I think we have promised our, our audience that we should draw to a, a close. So I just uh, like to thank you for a sort of real insight into what is, I mean, to me, it's a kind of unique combination of research and architecture. Uh, it, it's, it, it's really focused on innovation and that comes through in everything that you've said. And, and for me, you know, we've, we've begun to get into the, into the sort of climate crisis discussion. And to me, if we're going to have any hope of, of, of uh, meeting the, I mean, reducing the impact of carbon and the climate and, and reversing climate change and the biodiversity loss, uh, it, it, it's all going to come from collaboration. And, and the collaboration mm. that you talked about within your own organization, I think, is extraordinary. And... Uh, it's great that you're looking for other architects to work with because we have to work with you. And I'm sure there's other, lots of others out there that would as well. So thank you so much, um, Arden and, and, and Susan. And thank you to our, our, our audience out there. We hope you enjoyed it. And thank you to Vitra and to the uh, RIBA. There'll be another one of these shortly, which will uh, come up on the screen. But uh, good night, everybody, or oh, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank night. you all.